Yo, what's up my homies? So today I wanted to visit a topic that gets brought up fairly frequently and that is on the subject of caffeine and hair loss. Now, caffeine as a hair loss treatment is not obscure. There are many commercially available products such as shampoos and topical serums that contain caffeine and are marketed towards hair loss. One of the more famous ones is Alpacin, but there are also other brands as well including Head & Shoulders which has a caffeine shampoo variant and one of the active ingredients in Revita which is a hair loss shampoo is also caffeine. So, of course, it goes without saying that I am not talking about the oral administration of caffeine. Uh, caffeine is one of the most, uh, or if not the most used drug in the world, and it is found in beverages that almost everybody drinks, including coffee, tea, soft drinks, and it's also found in certain foods like chocolate. So if oral caffeine could stop hair loss, then logic would dictate that very few, if any people, would have issues with hair loss simply due to the fact that almost everybody consumes caffeine. Now, it has been shown that hair loss aside, caffeine, despite being a psychological active drug does have some potential health benefits, including some metabolic benefits like aiding in weight loss. It's also been shown to be beneficial as an ergogenic aid for certain athletes to improve sports performance. And it's even thought of as having some antioxidative properties that could stave off the development of long-term diseases like cancer. And it's also believed that caffeine consumed during middle and old age could reduce the risk of the development of dementia, although further research is needed on that subject. But that, of course, is not why you're here. You're here because you want to know about topical caffeine and how it can help with hair loss. Well, we do know through studies that caffeine can easily penetrate the skin barrier, so it has been examined extensively as a potential treatment for androgenic alopecia, and there is a fair bit of information online, but what I want to examine with all of you today is a review article on those studies, which was released this year in 2020. So before we discuss any outcomes of the studies, let's look at the theoretical mechanism behind how caffeine is supposed to stop hair loss or promote hair growth. So, it's well established that androgens, notably DHT, dehydrotestosterone, are the main culprit in hair loss in individuals who have androgenic alopecia, which is the when hairs, of course, are genetically sensitive to androgens such as the above-mentioned DHT. The way DHT destroys the hair follicle is that it disrupts the growth cycle of the hair through the inhibition of IGF-1, which works as a regulator of the hair growth cycle. So, as IGF-1 is inhibited, inhibited by DHT, this will cause the growth phase of the hair follicle known as the antigen phase to shorten, whereas the resting phase known as the telogen phase will be prolonged. This in turn results in the subsequent miniaturization of the hair follicle, and the theorized mechanism behind this is that IGF-1 promotes angiogenesis, which is increased local vascularization uh, to the hair follicles, and in absence of IGF-1, there is in turn reduced vascularization, which eventually kills the dermal papilla cells of the hair follicle until the follicle itself is destroyed and replaced by scar tissue. Now, caffeine is not hormonal in any way. It's not going to inhibit DHT or any androgens on the scalp. But as we know with other non-hormonal treatments like minoxidil or stamoxidine, the inhibition of DHT is not necessarily a prerequisite for the efficacy of a hair loss treatment. Some compounds like the above mentioned minoxidil work as hair growth stimulants uh, by managing to promote the growth of the dermal papilla cells even as the DHT tries to destroy them. This is why dermatologists will often recommend using both a growth stimulant like minoxidil in combination with an anti-androgen like finasteride since the growth stimulant will work to promote the growth of the cells which grow hairs while the anti-androgen will stop DHT from destroying the hair follicle giving the two drugs a synergistic effect. Well, the way caffeine works is that it inhibits the enzyme phosphodiesterase, which is part of the system that regulates the level of cyclic adenosine monophosphate, aka cyclic AMP, in the cells. Cyclic AMP is a growth stimulant, among other functions, and it is created by conversion of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, to cyclic AMP by substances that stimulate the beta receptors on the cells, like norepinephrine and epinephrine, which is basically adrenaline. The the enzyme phosphodiesterase breaks down the cyclic AMP, so a phosphodiesterase inhibitor like caffeine prevents cyclic AMP from breaking down. So both adrenaline and caffeine end up increasing cyclic AMP levels, uh, though by different mechanisms. That's why when you get an adrenaline surge, you get all jittery, and when you drink too much coffee, you feel the same way. It's all due to increases in cyclic AMP in your cells. So, like I said, cyclic AMP is a cell growth stimulant, and thus can cause hair 
cares to spend more time in the antigen phase and less time in the telogen phase, at least theoretically. Thus, that will stimulate hair growth. However, in vitro studies also show that caffeine increases IGF-1, which like I mentioned before, increases angiogenesis and thus improves blood supply to the hair follicles and also stimulates the antigen phase of hair growth. So the question is, can caffeine be utilized as a growth stimulant like minoxidil and can it be incorporated as part of an effective hair loss treatment regimen? And if so, how does it compare to an FDA approved treatment like 5% minoxidil, which is widely believed to be the strongest hair growth stimulant on the market? So Let's take a look at the in vitro studies on caffeine. There are a lot of studies that have been performed and usually they are performed in a cell culture of hair follicles. Like for example, a study performed in 2014 used hair follicles just dissected out of men with AGA, androgenic alopecia, that were then cultured and were then exposed to caffeine at concentrations of 10 or 50 micrograms per milliliter. And the caffeine ended up prolonging the antigen phase and it, increases to, and it also increased IGF-1 expression. And caffeine also inhibited apoptosis and necrosis, meaning it prevented cell death. And the study concluded that caffeine works by multiple mechanisms and is likely to be clinically effective in people with androgenic alopecia. There are a number of other studies which basically come to the same conclusion as well. But as you know from watching my videos, I do not hold in vitro studies in very high regard because I don't think they are necessarily good indicators of what happens in real life. So let's go ahead and take a look at the in vivo studies on topical caffeine and see how caffeine works on actual human beings like you and me. So my source, like I mentioned at the beginning and which I'll link below, is this 2020 review article on caffeine and hair loss. And right off the bat, looking at the authors of the study, they all list that they are employees of a company called Dr. Kurt Wolf, who just so happens to be the manufacturers of the famous Alpacin products, which include caffeinated shampoos and topical solutions marketed towards hair loss. One of the researchers, Dr. Clank, even appears in the commercials for it. So if you live in the UK or European Union, you've definitely seen these ads as they market the bleeding crap out of it. So this review article is essentially funded by the people trying to sell you caffeine-related hair loss products like shampoos and topical solutions, as we see from the Alpacin line of products. So looking at the in vivo studies, we find that like the review article, they also seem to be industry funded. For example, the only study directly comparing a 0.2% caffeine solution with 5% minoxidil has as the senior author Dr. Adolf Clank. That's right, it's the very same dude who appears in the commercials for Alpacin shampoo as well as other Alpacin related products. So Looking at the study, it was a randomized but open-label study, meaning that the subjects and the investigators knew which treatment they were receiving. This is a potential big issue because the people interpreting the results have a vested interest in seeing a positive outcome of their product. I mean, after all, you buying the product is how they earn money. So a blinded study would be much fairer as it would have removed the potential of industry bias. But in any case, in this study, there were 210 males with androgenic alopecia who were enrolled and and they were given a 0.2% caffeine solution, which is the same as the commercially available Alpacin topical solution. And their main endpoint for the study was looking at a change in the proportion of antigen hairs from baseline up until six months versus hairs uh, not in the antigen phase. So they basically just want to see how many hairs were in the growth phase on treatment versus how many hairs were in the growth phase before treatment. So the way they assessed this was by plucking a set number of hairs from the scalp and then examining them under a microscope to examine what growth phase each hair is in. Now, a big problem with this approach is where the hairs are coming from. Not all the hairs are equally as androgen sensitive. Although they say the hairs that did come from the frontal and occipital regions, even just minor changes in the location of hair harvesting might have a big effect on the results. And this is again a problem since the study is open label and the investigators may be biased in their selection of hairs. So a much better way they could have done this to measure hair growth would be to use something like a photo trigogram and measure things things like hair density and hair counts per square centimeter, as was done with uh, treatments like finasteride and minoxidil when they underwent the clinical trials that got them FDA approved in the first place. Finally, 
Another uh, big flaw, possibly the biggest flaw with the study, is that there is no control group. For all we know, if a control group had been used, they would have had the same changes in their antigen percentage as the treatment group. It makes you wonder if these parameters were deliberate in order to produce a favorable outcome for the product. Now, unfortunately, being that the study is industry funded, we cannot rule out this possibility. So. Looking at the results of the study, the percentage of hairs in the antigen phase increased with 5% minoxidil by 11.68%, and in the group on 0.2% caffeine, the increase was 10.59%. So even though minoxidil looks superior, the statistics are such that the difference was not statistically significant. So one interpretation of this is that minoxidil was actually superior, but the study didn't have enough subjects to demonstrate this. And since there is no control group, we we really can't say anything about which treatment is really better in this particular study. So based on this study, which as far as I know is the largest study done on caffeine and hair loss, we really cannot conclude if it has any benefits at all. This study just has far too many X factors and problems such as not having a control group, not using good tools to measure hair growth like a phototrichogram, as well as the very obvious industry bias. So. You want to compare this study to a uh, like the initial clinical trials of 5% minoxidil. I mean, that had thousands of participants in double-blinded randomized control trials, and it had very solid endpoints such as measuring hair counts with a phototrichogram, not to mention all the research was peer-reviewed by independent investigators in the FDA, and it wasn't just done by the, the company making the product. So... At best, it appears that caffeine solutions need more data to confirm their efficacy. I mean, perhaps a follow-up study done by an independent investigator using a double-blinded approach would yield better results. But in the meantime, I don't think anybody should think caffeine is a proven product despite how heavily marketed it is. I mean, people will often bring up the point ad nauseum that you can find a scientific study to back up anything. And this is true. And that's why it is especially important to be able to distinguish good scientific research from bad scientific research. Companies know that most people aren't scientifically literate enough to do this, which is why you keep seeing crap like Nutrafol, Viviscal, and yes, even Alpacin backed by scientific studies that don't really prove anything, but they will still appear legitimate to the layman who don't know any better. So... All that being said, though, I do want to say that even though I am not convinced by caffeine being an effective hair loss treatment, I do like the product Alpacin as a shampoo. I mean, it has nothing to do with it being able to help me re regrow any hair, but I do think it is a very high quality shampoo that I think tends to make the hair on my scalp stand up a little bit, and it just makes it look more voluminous. So maybe that's the reason why some people think it helps with hair loss, uh, but I don't think it's a bad choice from a cosmetic standpoint, but I certainly wouldn't rely on it as a hair loss treatment. I mean, the evidence just isn't there, especially compared to other hair loss treatments like finasteride minoxidil. But anyways, I think I'm going to go ahead and end things right there. So thank you for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Take care.